Um, well, the question would be is like, what are some of the other things that people can do to confirm this? To to you know, if what we've said already. Well, here's you know, here's a massive thing that we haven't even talked about at all. That's on my my new disc, disc number two, global warming. What the government isn't telling you. Um, the Gulf Stream. Uh huh. Here we go. The second most important story of the past 2,000 years, the most important story obviously being the birth of our Lord Jesus, the second most important story is the following. The Gulf Stream has stopped. Now, first of all, an explanation of what the Gulf Stream is. It's warm water coming up from the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean up the east coast of the United States, gets to about uh, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, and starts going east which it's done for many, many centuries. We don't know how many centuries. The Gulf Stream was given the name Gulf Stream by uh, Benjamin Franklin in, in the uh, about 200 years ago. It has many other names. The scientists call it uh, the North Atlantic Thermal Haline Conveyor. These ocean currents, of course, are all connected worldwide and all loop around and, and connect up with each other. The Gulf Stream, uh, as of June 12th last year, stopped. Now, my paper, No Need for Panic, wrote, written in the fall of 2005, published January 2006, I gave a warning there that the Gulf Stream was losing mass and velocity, and the scientists were saying then, six years ago, that anywhere from five to 20 years in the future, it would stop. Now, John, let me ask you something really quick. Now, here, here this might be another cover-up for them anyways, but uh, I've heard from some um, that uh, they try to reason that, oh, the Gulf Stream is stalled or what have you, and it's because of the oil. Now, is it possible that this oil spill was maybe, I don't know, maybe they set something up so they have an excuse later? Well, there's lots of speculation, and, you know, as a homicide detective, I live in the world of evidence. Oh, yeah. Um, Sometimes I'll be on the witness stand. I'll have a, an attorney wanting me to speculate. And, uh, you know, we're in front of a jury, and somebody's life's on trial here. I'll say, Counselor, do you want my sworn speculation? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can speculate with the best of them. Um, let's stay in the world of evidence for a while, and then we can speculate. Um, the Gulf Stream, uh, the engine that drove the Gulf Stream was the salinity, the salt content of the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, for the past 20 plus years, has been dramatically decreased each year because of melting freshwater ice in Greenland, melting freshwater ice in, in the Antarctic. The melting ice in the North Pole is floating seawater, so it doesn't change either the salinity or the ocean level, either one. Um, up in, now, they knew, they being the oceanographers, they knew the Gulf Stream was losing mass, losing velocity, and was becoming uh, a, a very very weak and very much at risk uh, phenomenon. Fast forward to, and they knew that years ago, uh, and I wrote about it in 2006. Fast forward to the spring of 2010, and we've got the British Petroleum Oil Spill. There was a university level experiment it's been repeated a number of times. We know this is true. They take an 8 by 8 foot tank, about 100 feet long, clear, clear plexiglass or glass, fill it with fairly cold water, maybe 50 degree water, salt water. And at one, at one end, you, you inject fairly warm, maybe 75 or 80 degree uh, temperature salt water at one end. It will move through there to forming a thermal barrier, move from one end to the other, uninterrupted, until you put oil in the mix. Mm -hmm. When you put oil in the mix, it breaks down the thermal barrier between the cold water and warm water. It all starts mixing up, and the stream stops. No. Oh, okay. It's, according to Dr. Zangari, I'll explain who Dr. Zangari is in a moment. That's what happened in June 12th of 2010, the, the British Petroleum Oil Spill broke a very fragile, very much at risk Gulf Stream is what it did. Uh, there's something in the Gulf of Mexico called the Gulf Loop Current, which loops around and used to come out between Florida and Cuba and join with the rest of the Gulf Stream going north on the east side of, of uh, Florida. Right. That's what broke on June 12th. Now, I was put in touch with Dr. Zangari 
the middle of July this past year, 2010. Dr. Zangari is a, it's Luigiani Zangari, he's a PhD scientist in Italy. He works with other scientists in Europe and North America exclusively on the Gulf Stream. That's all these men and women do. And um, when we first got in touch with him, he said he thought the Gulf Stream may have stopped. He had not yet confirmed it. They did more calculations, more research on the data, and he confirmed before the end of July that, in fact, on June 12th, the Gulf Stream had stopped. Okay. Now, that summer of 2010, in, in, my, in Russia, they had the worst summer in a 1,000 years. They've got weather records in, in Russia going back to the year 1010. This current winter, the scientists say they're having the worst winter in Moscow in a thousand years. The worst winter in Norway since 1788. The worst winter in, in the United Kingdom, England, Ireland, Scotland, in more than 200 years. In fact, the Charles de Gaulle Airport in France in, De in December was partly closed. They thought the roof might collapse because of a snow load. Yes, yes, I remember hearing about that. You know, Michael, if you're going to build a, one of the biggest airports on the planet, you're going to hire a very good commercial architectural firm with the best engineers. And if you ever thought there was even a smallest possibility of having to calculate for a snow load at the biggest, at one of the biggest, five or six biggest airports on the planet, do you think they would put that calculation in there when they were building this, this building? Of course they would. You would certainly think so. Of course they would. You know, these, these are very smart men and women. But they didn't, you know, it would be like calculating a snow load for Key West. Why would you do such a thing? That's you know? Right. That's right. <laughs> and, you know, the weather patterns have been going crazy everywhere. I mean, just the flooding alone. Well, they are. And this is what we haven't talked about and we need to talk about. The Gulf Stream provided a regulating factor for the jet stream. The jet stream is a 200-mile-an-hour wind, five miles up. That's always up there. That 200-mile-an-hour wind is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The jet stream has a very, plays a very great role in weather worldwide. In fact, here's a direct quote from Dr. Zangari. The Gulf Stream is the pacemaker of the climate of the planet. Now, that's very strong words. It is. On one hand. On the other, oh, my goodness, look at the weather. This past fall... Russia announced that they were not going to honor futures contracts already signed to deliver grains to other countries. Ukraine did the same thing. Now, Michael, that's not an act of war on one hand. On the other hand, it's about an inch away from being an act of war. That's how serious not honoring futures contracts is. Yeah. But they did the right thing. They're keeping the grain for their own people. That is the right thing to do. That's the responsible thing to do, isn't it? It certainly seems like it is. Yes, nice. it is. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. All grain-growing areas are at risk for the following reasons worldwide. Both hemispheres, northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. Now we're talking grains, corn, wheat, rice, soybeans, barley, oats, spelt. All these grains can tolerate a certain high level of precipitation, a certain low level of precipitation, a certain high level of temperature, and a certain low level of temperature. Within those parameters, you're going to get a harvest of corn, wheat, soybeans. Mm -hmm. Once you get too high of either precipitation or temperature, once you get too low of uh, precipitation or temperature, you'll start losing a percentage of your harvest to the point where diesel fuel costs more than you're going to get a harvest, so they don't even bother harvesting anymore. You lost your harvest. That's right. And that's what's happening. We're losing percentage of harvest all over the planet. Uh, we're at the lowest inventories right now in the United States in, in decades of grains. And grains are what feeds, feed the world. Grains are what feeds the people and the animals of this planet. And obviously, fruits and vegetables play a very large role. But when it comes to pure numbers and, and, the, and percentage of what gets the job done, it's grains. It's been said that the uh, food inflation is going to skyrocket. It is. For, it's going to be a double whammy because of the uh, reduced harvest and the increased price of petroleum products. Petroleum products are used at every step in, agricult in modern uh, agriculture. Fertilizers are made from petroleum products. The tractors run on diesel fuel. The insecticides are made from, from uh, petroleum products. Uh, at every step of the way, you've got petroleum products in the mix. 
that plus the reduced harvest is going to be a dramatic increase in all foods. Well, we're uh, we're in for a rough ride, uh, John. Absolutely, we, we are. We we definitely are, and you know I've seen even the changes here. I mean, I'm not originally from Carolina, but uh, being in Columbia, I've been here for a few years now. And uh, this past winter, I mean, we've seen snow a few times, which is a little unusual from what I understand. It is. I've seen photographs of homes in um, Ireland where the pipe comes out of the ground, the fresh water pipe under 40 pounds pressure, goes into the side of the house about three feet high, frozen and burst. You know, they, they don't even bother to bury the pipes. Yeah, you know, and there's different frost lines in different parts well, of the world. Well, that's true, and, uh, and these are engineering parameters, and depending where you are in, a, in the area I am, 18 inches is plenty deep. That Sometimes they bury them 24 inches to be safe. Our, our friend Bruce calling from Rochester, they probably bury the pipes up there three to four feet deep. In Moscow, they bury the pipes six to eight feet deep. Mm hmm now, you look at a map, and this is on my DVD, Global Warming, what the government isn't telling you. Look at a map of the world, and you look at England, Ireland, and Scotland, look at London. You go due east, and what do you run into? Moscow. Now, <laughs> obviously, London, before this current winter, never had very bad winters like Moscow, but that's where they're headed. And one or two things is about to happen here, Michael. Either we're at the beginning of a mini ice age, which could last 8, 10, or 12, 15 years, or we're at the beginning of a full-blown ice age, which will go on for maybe centuries. Something that I don't know if I want to survive. Because well, people make that statement, uh, but when it comes down to it, you'll do whatever you have to to survive. It's human nature, right? It is. It's, it is. It certainly people is. People make flippant statements like that, but that's all they are is flippant statements. <laughs> and the reason they make these flippant statements is to bring the conversation to a conclusion. Right. Yeah, well, that's something I'm definitely not trying to do right now is bring this to a conclusion. Well, we can't do that. It's talk radio, Michael. That's right. And, you know, <laughs> I'm far from done with, uh, you know, uh, questions and theories uh, about what's going to happen. Uh, one of the other things that um, I've been I have a, a buddy, a colleague, if you will, who uh, really gets out there after the New World Order. And uh, one thing that I think I've been kind of shifting a little, thinking, you know, this New World Order, somebody had pointed it out to me, and it really made sense. New World Order. It's for the New World. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, Jesse Ventura and Alex Jones exposed all these massive graves, uh, these these uh, caskets, if you will. Right. I mean, Plastic caskets. Yeah. yeah, and I'm thinking yeah. now it makes sense what those are for, and maybe the FEMA camps. This is for the people who, the refugees who come, you know, after it's, I guess, over. Right. Maybe, right? So. Right. Well, they aren't necessarily building these camps because they're mean old monsters, these New World Order people. They may be simply building them because they're going to need them. That's one of the things I think about, you know, but, uh, you know, and that's something else I'm wondering. Now, when it, when it does say two years after, um, you know, and they they got to eventually get out there and try to do some kind of cleanup or organization, right. right? What happens when these militaries find people who survived, such as yourself, maybe, in the mountains? Are they going to say, come with us, or are they going to leave you alone? That's a good question. I do not have an answer for that. I, I know what the goal is. The, the goal is to... Uh, have a shiny new world order where there's about, and um, if you ever talk about the Georgia Guidestones, you know what I'm talking about. Um, 500 million people alive on the planet, as opposed to 6.5 billion people. Um, and basically, two classifications, uh, very similar to the feudal times, where there's a small group of people who own and run most everything, and everybody else is a numbered and, and chipped uh, worker, right. worker slave. Now, what, you know, I wonder also about the different countries. You know, are, are, are the big countries in on this? Do they, like, are they saying, hey, you know, we're going to team well, the, up? The big countries, you know, Russia, China, United States, to a lesser extent, extent France and Canada and England, of course they're in on it and they know about it and they're doing what they can do. They fully intend to still be countries, I think. Uh, they may just have a, a one-world government. That's certainly is part of the picture. Yeah. Um, 
not that it would matter much. Government will extend as far as, as the uh, barbed wire goes, and there will be no government. You know, <laughs> government, after these events, will be, if there's any government at all, will be at the town level and county level for most people most of the time, going back to the way it was before World War II. Uh, before the, the Great Depression and Roosevelt, most, the most government most people saw most of the time was the county government. And we'll be going back to that. You know, once everything goes to hell in a handbasket, we also got to worry about these nuclear facilities. You know, what's going to happen with those? There's, there's no well, I, I believe the engineers that work there will do the right thing. And uh, that they will, if they have to shut them down, they will shut them down in a manner that's relatively safe. Um, and if you're not, if they don't, uh, just pray that you're not downwind from them. <laughs> you know? It'll be an awful lot of praying. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, uh, in this next segment, this last hour coming up, I want to talk about survival, um, okay. what people can do to survive. All right, we'll do that. We can take up an hour doing that real easy. Uh, absolutely, and uh, that's something I think uh, that's probably the most important thing. But uh, we have a few minutes before we go to our next break, and I had a question come in, uh, I guess from Nova? Is this from you or from the chat? This is, uh, how close is it going to get to us, Planet X? Um, well, Professor McCanning talks about action at a distance. Uh, we see this uh, every day with the moon. Mm -hmm. The moon is a relatively small object in space. It's about a quarter million miles away. And every, 20, every 12 hours, it moves all the oceans on the planet. Uh, high tide and 12 hours later, low tide. So that's action at a distance that anybody and everybody is certainly aware of. The tenth planet is three to five times larger than the planet Earth with a far larger iron-nickel core. If it comes within a million miles of Earth, it will cause great damage for the reasons I just stated. So how close it comes doesn't matter. It's already interacting with us. It's already causing problems, and these, these problems will continue to grow worse as it gets deeper into the, into the solar system. You know, and I'll tell you, John, I've tried through the years, you know, I've heard about Planet X, obviously the first time as a kid in school, um, you know, and I've always tried to, you know, ah, this is happening because of that, or this is happening because of that. And right. we've now come to a time where you really can't blow none of this off. I mean, just the, the extent that they go to hide the truth. They're hiding some truth, so you know, know. some kind of truth, and that just tells you, you know, th they know. I've ran into a few men in the last five years who had similar experiences from, at the high school level, university level, instructors who would peel back enough layers that, that people could figure out what was going on. Uh, it, does, it has happened over the decades, yes. I wish I had saved that, that uh, little magazine that I had uh, back in science class, but who knew? You know, I did bring it home with me, but I don't know whatever happened to it. Is your instructor still alive? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I haven't looked for him. I, I, it's definitely possible. Well, you never know. It, he may still have a copy of it and uh, might be in the school library. Who knows? Yeah, but if he knows too much, who knows? You know, that's something else. Why are they letting uh, people like yourself and me and, and everybody else who's out there talking about this, why are they letting this go on? Because they just don't expect it. We, we don't have that big an outreach. Yeah. Uh, we're, you know, the, we reach uh, less than 2% of the people in this country. Wow. And that uh, doesn't pose enough of a threat. We're 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 not a we're not a pimple on an elephant's butt, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> well, you know, I know that you've interviewed guys like Dr. Rand, and uh, I don't know if you ever had a chance to talk with Ann Eller. I have not. That's a new name for me. Oh well, she she was on the show. I don't know, maybe a few weeks ago, and uh, she's pretty much without the resources that you have, obviously. But mm. uh, she's pretty much come out and said a lot of the same things. And in her case, she says, you know, I'm an old woman. You know, I'm not going to run from it. You know, I've lived my life, and so she's not doing anything. She, you know, besides having food and water. I mean, she's right. not right. running for the right. hills. But right. uh, she did. Uh, she did pretty much confirm a lot of the things. A lot of the big questions come up. With the libraries and the, mm -hmm. the big mm -hmm. black square and the sky, Google Sky. and Oh, yeah. So, I mean, all the signs are there. John, really quick, before we take this break, can you give everybody your website again? My website is thelibertyman.com, thelibertyman.com. Toll-free number to order my global warming DVD is 800 592 
800-592-9543. I say again, 800-592-9543. The DVD is titled Global Warming, What the Government Isn't Telling You. All right, great, John. We're going to take this break, and then we'll be back uh, for our final hour. So, All right. So hang in tight. I'm Michael Vera. This is Late Night in the Midlands, and uh, you are getting uh, a 101 lesson on Planet X. I mean, this guy is, he's got the, the resources, he's got the credentials. Um, if you don't believe him, you know, I don't know, I can't do any better than this um, as far as credentials go. Uh, so John Moore is my guest, and uh, I know this isn't something everybody wants to hear. You know, I don't like it either. But, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Uh, just kind of ride the wave, uh, for lack of a better term. So, latenightinthemidlands.com, that's the website. Go on over and uh, become a member. Uh, you can listen live right there on the website. You can scroll down and join Nova in the chat room as well. Uh, if you want to email me, latenightinthemidlands at yahoo.com. And Glenn Kennedy's website is project.nsearch.com. And, again, I'm over there on uh, YouTube, Facebook, iTunes for as long as everything stays uh, as close to normal as it can. That's where you'll find Late Night in the Midlands. So we'll be back in a moment. We need to take this break. Uh, Planet X, I still say it's real. The number to call in to speak to the host, Michael Vera, is 803-7. But I'm trying to say, can't you feel the fears I'm feeling today? If the button is pushed, there's no running away. There'll be no one to save. Will the world in a grave? Take a look around you, boy. It's bound to scare you, boy. And you tell me over and over and over again. Well, you don't have to tell me over and over and over again, because I know, and that's what I'm trying to do, tell you all over and over and over again. And uh, off that last commercial there, if uh, you are a radio station and you're looking to pick up the feed of Late Night in the Midlands, I'll take my payment in gold. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, and do it soon before the oceans rise, will you please? You know, a <laughs> little success before I have to fly away. Uh, but I am Michael Vera. This is Late Night in the Midlands. And uh, again, the website, latenightinthemidlands.com. The email address, latenightinthemidlands at yahoo.com. And uh, Glenn Kennedy's website is Project insert.com so uh, yeah eve of destruction uh, very fitting for tonight uh, we won't be pressing any buttons especially after planet x comes around that's for sure uh so okay john we're going to talk a little bit about survival now all right uh, let's do that this, even. well the the first and most important thing anybody can do is get their spiritual house in order i, I cannot emphasize how uh, important that is above and beyond anything and everything else I use the example of uh, American POWs in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, men and women uh, in a prisoner situation, eating the same food, wearing the same clothes, doing the same work, having the same housing and medical attention. Those who went into that experience with a strong spiritual belief system were far more likely to, to survive it than those that did not. Mm -hmm. It's not even debatable. Um, it, it will be, if it's once you get involvement when in your spiritual preparedness and your, your spiritual belief system it will be something you'll do the rest of your life if you're not already doing it in addition you need skills now the skills are commonly found on farms and ranches all over this country dozens and dozens of skills that we've been talking about off and on during the show the two skills however that are very important and in, in, in least uh, and found in the least amount would be the skills of a ham radio operator and the skills of emergency medical treatment. Those are the two skills most needed and in least amount of supply, no matter what the community, big cities, little cities, farms, ranches. Uh, I encourage people to acquire those skills. Um, most communities are going to have a ham radio club. You can find out where, who the ham radio people are in your area. Two methods. One, you can go to your local Radio Shack store, talk to the manager. Uh, almost without a doubt, the manager of your local Radio Shack store will know about the local ham radio uh, men and women. 
The other way is to go to the Federal Communications uh, Commission website, the FCC website, go to the amateur radio section, and you can find all the licensed ham people in any zip code in the United States are kept by zip code. Uh, I've known these men and women and worked with them now for oh, better part of 20 years. I'm a, I'm a licensed ham operator myself. And most of the time, ham radio men and women like to share their knowledge, help people gain this information. The, the FCC set up the ham radio uh, section specifically to help out in times of emergency. That's why it was set up initially. That's why it exists. Emergency medical treatment. Your local fire chief may be putting on CERT training, CERT, that, that's a Community Emergency Response Team training, which does include some first aid training, or perhaps a first responder course where I'm working with my local fire chief to, uh, and paramedics to do that uh, here in my community. Your local Red Cross may put on first aid training, possibly the local hospital, maybe the local junior college. All uh, are places that you may find uh, emergency medical treatment training. So I encourage people to get the training and get the equipment and supplies to go along with it. If you have emergency medical treatment supply equipment that you're not qualified to use, you could hurt or kill somebody. So don't get equipment you're not qualified to use, or if you do, be sure to ex exercise the discipline not to use it uh, until you've got the training. Ham radio equipment does take some uh, knowledge before you can use it successfully. When, I, when I'm in front of an audience, uh, Michael, I'll ask the audience, who here, who here has a two-way radio with them this morning? Nobody raises their hands. <laughs> and I take out my cell phone and I say, guess what? This is a two-way radio. Um, cell phones are incredibly simple to use. Most seven- and eight-year-olds can use them quite well. But ham radio equipment does take some knowledge and some skill before you can use them successfully. That's right. And cell phones, uh, for that matter, uh, they're probably not going to be usable, are they? Well, all it takes for cell phones not to be usable is what's called system overload. And too many people want to make a phone kind of phone call. In fact, in most metropolitan areas, around 3 o'clock or 3.30, all the kids get out of school, uh, you can't make a phone call on a landline. <laughs> 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 I mean, seriously, system overload affects landlines as well as cell phones. Um, so that's very true also. Uh, in addition, the government can, can shut down all the cell phone users except themselves. They have that capability to shut down all cell phone usage except their own, mm -hmm. if they choose to. Well, it's just a flick of a switch for satellites, wasn't it? Isn't it the satellites? Well, they have, at the central switching stations is where it's done, right. Mm -hmm. And they can do that. And, and if they need to, they'll do it and, and make sure the system overload doesn't affect them. Yeah. Well, well, Absolutely. I, yeah. Of course, you need electricity to make cell phones work at all, and, and that's at risk with for a variety of reasons, coronal mass ejections and, and um, you know power grids going down and so forth. Right. And now there's going to be... A Quite a uh, quite a bit of debris that I would think is going to be pulled in with Planet X, correct? I mean, Planet so X travels in a debris field a quarter million miles wide on either side of it. So we're going to get nailed by all kinds of stuff. Oh, yes. Rocks, rocks the size of basketballs, rocks the size of pickup trucks, rocks the size of Rhode Island. Um, <laughs> and there's... The more you, you get into this, I found, you know, when I was a kid, my, we went on a family vacation. I saw a meteor crater out west. It's about a mile wide, about a half mile deep. I found out there's a crater here in my county that's 12 miles wide that they didn't know even existed until they had satellite imaging. <laughs> wow. And there's a string of these craters across the United States that go... Uh, we, I don't know if anybody knows how long they've been there, but they're basically in a straight line, meteor crater out, you know, I think, is it Arizona, meteor crater? Uh, or New Mexico, anyway. Uh, there's a straight line, these things, across the United States where they most likely all hit at about the same time. And they've obviously all been there long enough where people aren't talking about them. Well, they're so big, a, a crater 12 miles across, you can't tell it's a crater until you're up in a satellite. Yeah, exactly. It's that big. Okay, so it, so then that leads me to worry about even being on the mountain. So if you get away from the ocean, you still have to worry about. Well, there's, there's. I wondered for a while when I started learning about this why the 
powers that be so preoccupied with getting underground. Mm -hmm. There's two reasons. They, these rocks coming at us and the coronal mass ejections. Coronal mass ejections will make the surface of the, of course, it's only half the planet that hits it. For about an hour to an hour and a half, the, the part of the planet that's being hit by the coronal mass ejection will be about 140 degrees. Ooh. Ooh is right yeah, now. It's a little hot. I routinely sit in a sauna at 150 degrees because of the health benefits, and I can tolerate that. But people who are at risk, who have uh, health conditions, the very young, the very old, people with uh, low, very low blood pressure, you know, this is a just flat kill them. You know, sure, sure, absolutely, and it'll, it'll wipe out uh, all grass plants like corn and wheat, for example. Um, a coronal mass ejection is quite an event if it if it gets as bad as it could be and uh, i have a feeling it will if this thing is uh triple the size of earth and it's going to be coming in between the sun and and the earth uh then i have a feeling we're going to get quite a uh uh hit from this thing absolutely uh, the the odds are in favor of that the government is preparing for this. They're not prepared for a worst-case scenario, but they're prepared for a very bad scenario. Now, and, that, and again, back to the satellites. They're all going to be wiped out, aren't they? Pretty Most much. Of them? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Uh, it's the, the military satellites will be the most resistant between the rocks flying and hitting them and the coronal mass ejections. It's hard to say how many, if any, will survive it. Okay, so now what are some of the things that people should be doing, uh, even if they if they have their safe haven? Uh, I mean, what about uh, medical supplies such as antibiotics and stuff? How do you get your hands on? on that okay, well, uh, farm supply stores will sell antibiotics over the counter uh, with no prescription. You can buy them by the pound, and um, that's a pretty good thing. Uh, it's the same antibiotics from the same companies come off the same production line as the ones that uh, the human beings consume. They're just packaged differently. Uh, you would need to get some gel caps of the right size and package it because it comes. I buy this stuff every few years because they eventually run, you know, expire. Uh -huh. uh, get gel caps and uh, fill up the gel caps with the antibiotics, and, and then it's ready for human consumption. Now, you say at far you can get these at, at farm markets? I have somebody asking me. Okay. Farm supply stores. Farm supply where the, stores. Where the ranchers and farmers go to get their supplies for their cattle and horses. Oh, okay. So then you really, uh, I mean, you could probably find out the proper dosage to put in these capsules. Probably that information is probably available right on the Internet, huh? Well, you, if, you, if you need a... 250 milligram gel cap uh, of antibiotics. You get a 250 mil milligram gel cap and fill it up. Um, the smart thing to do would be to weigh it so that you get the right milligrams of dosage. Um, take too too many. Uh, taking too large a dose of antibiotics is, will cause harm to your your gut. The uh, the uh, of course even low levels do it. The, there's really there's good bacteria in your in your intestines that the antibiotics will kill. In fact, we encourage people. My wife's a chiropractor. People who've taken an, a course of antibiotics to uh, consume yogurt and other things that that will rebuild the uh, the good uh, bacteria that's in your gut, that's in your intestines, which is kind of a rabbit trail, but. Um, some people are very much at risk. People that take thyroid medication, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an epidemic of thyroid cancer and thyroid-related problems where people have part or all their thyroid remo removed, and um, they cannot live. They will die without their thyroid medication. Um, there are ways to get uh, thyroid uh, from animals, uh, like monkeys, for example. Mm -hmm. there's, and I don't have the research material here in front of me. But people need to be looking at alternatives for, for prescription medications if they need these things to stay alive. That's right. And they should probably make their dentist appointments now. And Oh, yes. Not having access to modern dentistry uh, will not be fun. <laughs> no, it would be very dangerous at, at that. Uh, believe me, I've had uh, infected tooth before. Um, and I uh, tried to pull it myself once, and I'll tell you, my face blew up like a balloon. Oh, I bet. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yeah, I had a I have a couple of one or two capped teeth, and one of them came off on a weekend, and I used super glue to put it back on.
Really? My dentist always gets me about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dentistry, that's definitely something that's important because if you have an infected tooth and, you know, we get into this Planet X thing and there's nobody's going to be able to take care of it for you, that can kill you. Absolutely. And I'm working with my local uh, mayor, chief of police, fire chief, to uh, make sure that we do have a dentist that's on the, on the premises in our little community. Uh, that's a very, very important thing. That is important. You know, and it, it, I mean, how many of these communities do you think are actually set up now? How many people, how many? Uh... It's a small percentage that have done it right, really. Yeah, well. You know, it's a small percentage. And I encourage people, uh, a lot of people, they think, well, my wife and I, you know, we're going to get our 40 acres and we're going to have an island of refuge. That's a prescription for disaster. You need to ingratiate yourself and be part of your local community. You really do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this island concept, me and my honey against the world, that's, a, that's just a prescription for di disaster is all that is. Absolutely a prescription for disaster. Uh, you need to become part of the community, join the local church, get active in local civic organizations, um, especially if you're not related by blood or marriage to people in the area. And, and I am related by... Uh, to people in my area, I found out after moving here. I'm, my mother's side of the family is from this part of the world, and, and it's been very good, and it helps me be accepted. But if you don't have um, people you're related to by blood and marriage, you better get to know people, and they need to get to know you, because in a time of crisis, uh, you don't want to be looked at as somebody who's unknown, unknown quantity. Can we trust this person? What's this person like? Uh, the community, these little communities, Michael, they will survive as communities, or they will go down as communities. That's what will happen. Yeah. Uh, now, what about water? Um, well, you need access to potable water that you own and you control. Uh, you do not want to be dependent on any kind of municipal or county water supply. You really don't. You're making yourself very vulnerable when you do that. And the bottom line is you need a well or a spring or a lake or a pond or a creek or something uh, where obviously it's open water you need to be able to filter it mm -hmm. before you can consume it now do you have any uh, specific filtering uh, systems that you recommend well I, I offer the Berkey system at my website it's a, they've been around for about a century so they they've pretty much got it down they know what they're doing the, the Berkey filters uh, for in the field uh, I don't sell them but I like the Katata and they're made in Europe uh, they're mill spec and they're very compact and they do an excellent job of filtering water out in the bush uh, with a very compact, basically the little uh, Katahdin mini ceramic is about as big as two packs of cigarettes and will filter hundreds of gallons of water. Okay, and now, I mean, again, people got to realize that uh, they're not going to have electricity, so they're not going to be able to just store stuff in the refrigerator. So they're going to want to, uh, if they don't know how now, they're going to want to know how to can uh, and so on, aren't they? Those are some of the skills still still commonly found in farms and ranches. Mm -hmm. Raising food, uh, pre preserving food with canning and dry dehydration and drying uh, and salt. Uh, you can preserve meat by drying it, making a jerky uh, and using salt. Um, there's lots and lots of skills, and I'll recommend a couple of books that, that uh, cover those skills. Okay. Dare to Prepare by Holly Deo is an excellent one. Another one I have here at hand is Making the Best of Basics by James Stevens with a V. James Stevens. It's, in a, it's been around for about 20 years. He keeps adding to it and making it bigger. Um, but you need to practice these skills. These are things that can't be learned by reading a book. The book will get you started and help you figure out what you need to do, but you need to practice the skills and learn the skills by doing them. That's right. Uh, so we got another break coming up here in a minute, um, and uh, then I'd like to talk a little further about uh, anything that we haven't covered as far as survival. And uh, one thing I'm curious now, uh, now you were in the uh, military, and I know that on your last CD, um, your new, latest CD, that uh, 
Um, you had another Navy personnel who came out. That's right. We'll talk about Tim Spencer when we come back from the break. This is very important stuff. It's critical, actually, to everything we're doing. All right, great. Well, let's do that then when we come back. Uh, so just hang on, John, and uh, we've got another half hour to go here uh, on Late Night in the Midlands. I'm Michael Vera. This is Late Night in the Midlands. John Moore is my guest, and I'm hoping we'll be able to get him on again uh, before it's too late, but uh, we'll see. I don't know. Uh, he's definitely uh, contributed to this show, uh, coming on several times and uh, trying to warn uh, and spread the word and prepare everybody who listens to this show so uh i definitely appreciate that and i know a lot of you do and for the ones who are sitting back right now laughing about this whole thing well all i could say is you got a great sense of humor i'm michael vera this oh, okay john okay mr tim spencer yes um as you know, I'm a homicide detective. We were having a fundraiser for a client of mine charged with homicide, and uh, uh, it was put on sponsored by the Western Cherokee Nation. And uh, there's a gentleman walking around with a very official ID badge that said West, uh, "Director of Preparedness, Western Cherokee Nation." So I introduced myself. It is Tim Spencer, and. Um, uh, my DVD had just been come out, the, the first disc had just come out, and I get him a copy, I, I, he watches it, he gets back with me a week later, he says, John, I've seen your, this map before, I said, really? He says, yeah, I was working in New Orleans, I was in the Navy Submarine Corps doing classified work, and I saw your map. Well, we got together and talked, we've since become very good friends. And Tim has done what no other Navy veteran has, has agreed to do. He's gone public with me. I, my interview with him appears on disc number two of Global Warming, What the Government Isn't Telling You. And he talks about the map that he saw while he was in New Orleans. And, uh, and we chat for a while. And uh, his wife is my friend also. And, and uh, three of us were having lunch about uh, two years ago this spring. And... Uh, <laughs> As we're having lunch, he says, John, Tim and I are from Central Florida. We like sus we like fresh seafood. Mm -hmm. She says, I don't like snow. I don't like ice. I don't even like Missouri. We're here because of that map. And when Tim retired from the Navy, he moved his family to the Arkansas-Missouri Ozarks because of the map. And um, he's gone public. The interview is on my DVD. It's very powerful stuff, isn't it? It certainly is, John. Is. I'll tell you, the second CD, the first one was good enough. The second one really knocked it home. Well, I needed to do that. Um, I put these DVDs together just like I was doing a trial notebook for a homicide. I know how to put evidence together in a logical, progressive format sure so that do. it makes sense and people understand it. And the lawyers who watch this, they recognize trial preparation when they see it because they do it themselves. That's what I did here, uh, Michael. I, I was doing trial preparation, and, and the people watching the DVD, they're the jury. And my job is to convince the jury and bring the evidence to the table, as we say in my business, clear and convincing evidence. And I bring an overwhelming amount of clear and convincing evidence to the point where most reasonable, rational people reach the desired conclusion, that being, this is real. This is very real, and you need to pay attention. You need to get ready. You need to get ready right now. Yeah, and for those who are waiting for Fox News to jump out and say, hey, guess what, Planet X is coming, forget it. You know, you're not going to yeah, hear it. My, uh, when I first presented this to my kid brother, he's 10 years younger than me, he says, John, if this was true, Dan Rather would tell me so. <laughs> <laughs> you should have recorded that because you could have played it back and got a good laugh every time you heard it. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, but people need to convince themselves. Um, a lot of people find out that my DVD will wake up their spouse where nothing else has worked. I had a lawyer out in California buy a copy. He said, he calls me up. He says, John, I've been trying to convince my wife for years. Your DVD finally did it. I need five more. 
<laughs> yeah, you know what? I'm going to get a couple copies and send them over to um, my kid's mom. Uh, you know, she needs to see this. Because, Absolutely. Oh, I tell her about it, and she thinks, you know, oh, there goes your father again with them crazy ideas. It's That's like, right. It's like, That's I didn't right. come up with the idea of Planet X. So apparently the universe did. <laughs> well, absolutely. There was a uh, ministry down in Texas. I got a call from the, uh, the, the one of their administrative assistants last week. They gave, I gave them permission to make 10,000 copies of my DVD. Well, that is very nice of you. Well, uh, I, here's what I tell people. As long as you're not selling it, make as many copies as you want. Right. You know, and that's what makes, you know, I mean, you're already legit in my eyes, but when I hear stuff like that, I mean, you know, that really cuts out these debunkers who want to say, oh, I'm just trying to sell a CD or a book, and it's not about that. I mean, you know, you know you're doing kind of funny, you know, people will say, well, you're just trying to make money. I mean, would they say that about a plastic surgeon who's putting their loved one's face back together? The, thank you very much. You know, well I mean, <laughs> we compensate people with money for their expertise. Exactly. Which, there's nothing illegal, immoral, or fattening about that. <laughs> so what they want, I mean, it, would it be any better if you didn't sell the CD and you put all your money and all your hard-earned resources into it just to get them out to people? I mean, something, right. well, somebody's got to pay for that. Yeah. That's, Michael Vera's time has value, my time has value, and in, in Western culture, we compensate that value with money. There's nothing wrong with that at all. That's right, and you know what? I appreciate uh, what you do because, I'll be honest, I've talked to a lot of uh, experts on Planet X, and you uh, and, and the research that you've presented, the evidence that you've presented to me has woke me up better than anybody's. Honestly, it has. Well, if you're going to stack me up against uh, Jason Rand and some of these others, so that's a that's a pretty extreme compliment there, Michael. Well, it's true. You know, uh, Dr. Rand, I, I love the guy. I've had him on this show several times. He's a great guy to talk to and interview. Um, but he does seem to think the timeline. I'm just not with the timeline so much. He's He thinks it's going to be 50 years down the line before this happens. Well... Uh, funny you should mention that. I do encourage people to watch uh, Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth. Mm -hmm. Al Gore states in that film that the middle of the century, which would be 2050, is when things are going to get bad. Now, that's what NASA says. Mm, that's all the more you shouldn't believe it. Well, <laughs> never a straight answer, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, if, if, if these events were going to happen in the middle of the century, why would they move all these CIA people who will be retired and no longer in the system now? You know? Exactly. Uh, why would they be in such a hurry to build a seed vault in six months now when they could take a more leisurely uh, pace and save a tremendous amount of money? Uh, these things are being done now because they have no choice. The CIA and NSA, EPA library are all being moved now because they have no choice. Um, if these people are all going to be retired, why would they bother moving them now? Yeah, I had somebody actually uh, gave me the idiotic answer about Plum Island. So, oh, they're moving that because too many people know about it now. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> really, are you really kidding me? It's like, you know what, I'm going to get you for your birthday some floaties, and I hope that you do well. <laughs> well, um, well, it is funny. <laughs> you know, it's 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 serious stuff, but some of the things people come up with uh, are absolutely funny. And some are just plain in denial. Others, they know it's true, but they just will not accept it. And you know, no, they won't. And and that's going to be that reality is not going to change, Michael. You know, my DVD is making a, a big difference. Uh, on one hand, on the other, if we reach 1.5 percent of the people in this country, I would be surprised. Well, you know, there's uh, people like yourself who are they're out there spreading the word. And, you know, a lot of people know about this. It's just not enough people take it serious. They Absolutely. Think, they just can't imagine it happening to them. And it, if it's never happened before, it'll never happen in the future. Right. And, well, the thing is, it has happened before. It just hasn't happened to them. Exactly. <laughs> you know, the evidence is out there. I've interviewed Michael Cremo, and uh, he's believed this has happened six times before. At least, uh, Michael Michael Cremo is one of my heroes. I uh, love that guy. The cutting edge archaeology work he's done. You know, him and Jonathan Gray are contemporaries. Um, 
uh, there's multiple, multiple evidence. We talked about this earlier in the show of high technology having existed on this planet in the distant past. And oh, Michael yeah. Grimo is one of the best people on the planet to document this. He sure is. I mean, it's just the work that he's done is incredible. And if nothing else, I'm glad that I had an opportunity to do this show just because of all the great minds that I've been able to pick through, even your own, sir. And, uh, uh, you know, and I have actually have Jesse Ventura coming up on the show next month uh, on August. Yeah, I want to get Jesse on my show also. You know, when he started these this series of programs, I thought, oh, it's going to be a bunch of fluff. It won't amount to anything. <laughs> yeah, well, it did. <laughs> uh, it did. I mean, God bless Jesse Ventura. The man has no fear, and he, they were not fluff at all. He really got into some hard topics and hit them hard. Yeah, you know, there's a couple I would really like to see him tackle. One is the chemtrail and the other is uh, Planet X. I'd really like to see him go after that. Well, is he going to have more shows? Do you know? Um, I'm not sure. I thought that he was. Um, okay. As far as I, I know. know, I think that he's doing... I know that they've been putting some heat on uh, the station there uh, about not playing certain shows. Well, that I confirmed this on uh, one of my, in my weekend uh, presentation. There was this uh, service called TiVo, where you can record uh, yes. television shows and watch them later. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I am. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, apparently, TiVo went in to people's machines or TiVo machines in their homes. They can do this by remote control, of course, and erased some of the Ventura shows. Yes, they did. And you know what? I'm happy to say that uh, Glenn Kennedy and myself, uh, we've got I've got the full-length shows on my website. I had them wiped off my website not too long ago, too, uh, John, but I got them back up there. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Now, as Bo Greit says, you know you're over the target when you're taking flack. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, this is amazing. This is just absolutely amazing what they're doing. And these countermeasures is what I call them, countermeasures. Uh, they'll tolerate people being woke up to a point. Jesse Ventura, you talk about coming after me. Jesse Ventura has nationwide recognition because of the things he's done, the movies and being governor. Uh -huh. And a lot of exposure. Uh, these TV shows, they'll, we can see where the edge is where they won't tolerate anymore. And Ventura shows that we're erased off TiVo. That's the edge. They won't tolerate that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I just, it's amazing to me the lengths that they go. And, I, you know, and then there's going to be people who had it erased off their TiVo, so oh, it was just an error. You know, they don't oh, want to yeah. look into what it really is. And I just can't stress enough to everybody listening that this is real. And, you know, I love on your CD how you ask, let me, you said, let me just ask you all one question. Would your government lie to you? And I thought that was a great way to get things rolling. It is. And it's, very, it's the most important question you can ask. It, yeah, it certainly is. And, uh, you know, I remember you asked me the first time you came on my show, and and I kind of laughed and I said, oh, yeah, yes, they would lie. And that's the response <laughs> that most mature audiences will give. They start laughing, and the, and the, it's a, it's kind of a, uh, uh, oh, a spontaneous, uh, hysterical type laughter, but it, it's there for a reason, because most mature adults agree that the federal government of the United States would lie to us. Oh, absolutely, and they are lying to us. They're absolutely lying to us. And, you know, some will argue that they should tell us about Planet X, and others will say, well, they couldn't. I don't know what to think about that. I, I think that in small ways the information has been getting out to us. I don't know as though they, and I don't want to defend the government by no means, right. but, but I don't think they could come right out and broadcast it on TV. Everything would go to hell, wouldn't it? Well, uh if it was given the kind of credibility that the evening news would give it, or a, a major political figure like the Secretary of State or somebody, yeah, it would be a mess. Yeah. It would be an absolute mess real quick. So, Absolutely. So, and, and that's a reason why I think, you know, uh, I know they found those uh, coffins, I'll bring it up again, in 